everyone. I'm Jackie Leventhal, and I'm the Chief Brand and Content Officer here at Sixth and I. Whether you're here with us in person or watching virtually from home, on behalf of Sixth and I and our partner, Politics and Prose, thank you for being with us tonight and for supporting a nonprofit and an independent bookstore. This is an exciting time for Sixth and I and Politics and Prose because we're both celebrating milestone anniversaries, 20 years for Sixth and I and 40 years for Politics and Prose. Yeah. You all seem like the kind of people who want to help us celebrate. Uh, so to support Politics and Prose, you can buy lots of books from them tonight and always. And here at Sixth and I, we'd be so grateful if you would make a symbolic donation of 20 bucks for 20 years. And there are QR codes on the back of the pews that you can scan to donate through Venmo, and we sincerely thank you. So we're 83 days from the election, I think, but who's counting? Uh, <laughs> short of a crystal ball, I don't think you could ask for fresher or more insightful perspective than what you'll hear from our guests tonight. Brian Tyler Cohen is a YouTuber with more than 2 billion views of his progressive political commentary. He's the first, yes. He's the first independent content creator to interview President Biden. With his finger on the pulse of younger voters, Brian's podcast, No Lie, is a destination for top names in politics, from AOC to Rachel Maddow to Vice President Harris. In Brian's new book, Shameless, he explains how American politics has turned into a dire situation and what can be done about it. In his clear and to the point style, he unpacks the increasing gulf between the Republican brand and their actual behavior and the role mainstream media has played in normalizing it. Brian is joined in conversation tonight by MSNBC host, Jen Psaki. Some of you may have been here, yeah. Some of you may have been here in May when Jen spoke about her New York Times best-selling book, Say More, Lessons from Work, the White House, and the World, and we have autographed copies for sale. During her more than 20 years in public service, Jen served as White House Communications Director under President Obama, the spokesperson for the State Department under Secretary of State John Kerry, and most recently, of course, as White House Press Secretary under President Biden. We're very excited to have Shaniqua McClendon moderating tonight's conversation. She is the Vice President of Political Strategy for Crooked Media, and she created their voter and volunteer engagement program, Vote Save America, which, which has raised more than $55 million for progressive candidates and causes and mobilized more than 500,000 voters, volunteers, and donors. Shaniqua began her career as a White House intern for President Obama. Later in the program, we'd love to hear your questions, and you'll be invited to line up at the microphones in either aisle. With that, thank you all again for joining us. Please help me give Brian Tyler Cohen, Jen Psaki, and Shaniqua McClendon a warm welcome to Sixth and I. Thank you all for coming. Wow. I'll tell you what, uh, I, I was approached to, to do this book and working in, in, on YouTube mostly and in, in digital media where everything is so quick, I was, I was pretty hesitant to write something that would take so long to actually put out. Usually things are obsolete within, you know, like six hours, 12 hours, <laughs> certainly a day. But i um, glad I made this decision and so I hope you all like my book about why it's so important to vote for Joe Biden. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I will say, other than Joe Biden not being the nominee anymore, everything felt very like relevant and fresh. I kept yeah, thinking, I, did he just finish writing this I book? did make a concerted effort to not make it a book about Joe Biden and Donald Trump, so there is, there is that. 
But I think I did, I think I did suggest that we vote for Joe Biden. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and the rest of his ticket. So there you have it. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming today. Um, I'm really excited about this conversation. Um, the book is really good. I hope, ev well, I'm assuming, I think everyone gets one. I don't know. If you haven't, buy it. Um, but it's, it's a really good read. Um, and I think it really encapsulates a lot of, you know, I've been working in pop politics for 15 years. And you really capture a lot of stuff that I've just seen happen and couldn't really make sense of it in, in a really good way. Um, so before we begin, I just want to give another round of applause to Brian and Jen for joining oh. us today. I was going to give up Brian. Oh. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> And with that, we'll just, we'll just jump right in. Um, so again, I really, really enjoyed the book. Um, and you know, sometimes I just read, and I did it this time, I just read the book before reading any summaries or anything telling me what it's about. And by the time I was through the first chapter, I knew why it was called Shameless. But you absolutely understand it as you get through it. But it's largely about political messaging and really emphasizes how Republicans have weaponized messaging uh, and rhetoric to amass power and just have no shame about it. Uh, for me, at least, I started to see this during the Obama presidency where just the level of respect and tact coming from Republicans completely diminished. And so I'm curious what your theory is on how we got here. Um, and Jen, if you could follow up, you know, your career has spanned a lot of the craziness we've seen from Republicans. So if you could just, <laughs> you know, add your thoughts on, on sure. how you think we got here. In terms of how we got here, uh, I think Republicans, to their credit, it's not too much, I'll credit them with here, but we'll start off with this, already crediting the Republicans. To their credit, they're very good at laying their plans down and playing the long game, basically. And so we saw this, for example, with the Ailes memo, Roger Ailes memo, that would ultimately become what Fox News is today. And you saw what happened to Richard Nixon in 1974, and there was no backup for him, basically. And so he said, you know, basically, we want to make sure that what happened to him never happens to a Republican president again. And of course, the natural conclusion of that is today, where Donald Trump did something objectively a hundred times worse than what Richard Nixon did with Watergate. And not only was he not excommunicated from the party, but they've rallied around him. He has an entire ecosystem bolstering him right now. And, uh, and he's, you know, they've rallied around him so that he is the Republican nominee for president of the United States again. And so between the media ecosystem that they created, that they laid those plans, um, you also look at Project Red Map, for example, which was... Uh, and, and I speak with this uh, on my YouTube channel. I talk to Mark Elias about this stuff as well. And this is just this idea that Republicans about in the immediate aftermath of Barack Obama being elected in 2008 decided that they wanted to gerrymander uh, legislative districts and congressional districts across the country. And this stuff takes time and they have to be patient. And that's exactly what they were. Uh, the same thing with judges. I mean, we all know Mitch McConnell's, uh, you know, his... Uh, his involvement in reshaping the judiciary, but all of this stuff takes so much time and they are very patient about this and all of it does seem to be coming to a head right now, which is bad for us and bad for democracy, but uh, here we are. And I think it's, it's you know, the, the, the fact that we are aware of it at this point allows us to figure out how to get ourselves out of the situation that we're in. Yeah, first let me just say, I'm gonna give a plug for the book because I've been around communicators a long time. Brian Tyler Cohen is a phenomenal communicator and he doesn't need any more followers on his YouTube channel like he has a bazillion <laughs> but if you're not following him you should follow him because he explains complicated issues and things happening and policy making and people think the American public isn't smart enough for some reason they are um, obviously everyone in this room is but I mean writ large um, he's and the book is really good you didn't talk about chapter two in your book, so I'm gonna talk about <laughs> chapter two in your book because chapter two in the book, don't skip around, but I'm just giving you a hint about <laughs> chapter two. So chapter two has this great kind of thematic that I keep thinking about, about how for so long the Republican Party has, talked, has presented themselves as the party pro-family party, the party that is going to reduce our debt, the only party that can stand up for our military, right? That has been what the party platform has been. If you look back, we're going, about to go into a convention, for decades. Now, it's only really been over the last 10 years that it has been so exposed as that being an absurd notion. I mean, just look, and these are all examples Brian gives in, in chapter two. Um, 
you know, the party of the military is the same party where one Republican member was holding up um, members of the military receiving well-deserved raises, right? And also holding up people being confirmed. Is that the party of the, our servicemen and women? I don't think so, right? You know, this is the same party, the pro-family party, that has a guy leading the party who was cheating on his wife with an adult film star and paying her off. I'm just going to say it, right? Okay? So, like, this is not, and this has, and then people are standing by him. It's a really good chapter. The book is really good. But I would say, how did we get here? I think in some ways, there's still a possibility of working together in Washington. I'm not going to be totally negative here. I mean, Joe Biden, I know he's not, it's okay. <laughs> the rest of your book is very relevant. But he is still a, was a believer in this, still is a believer in this. Things he said he was going to do when he ran for president, people said, you'll never do that, you'll never do that, you're so naive. 17 Republican senators voted for the infrastructure bill. Okay, so it, things can happen when it's things people care about, right? It is possible. But I do think at times, people get, including political people here, get lulled into complacency because there's moments of success, right? So I'm going to give you an example. When I, worked, when I came in with Barack Obama, I'd never been to the White House before. I was like going up to the like, Emerald City and like knocking on the door. <laughs> and, um, and, but during that period of time and transition, um, we worked very closely with the Bush administration on the financial crisis, like ha hand in hand. I mean, I was a, a young spokesperson. I wasn't solving the financial crisis, but we all did. That was how government is supposed to work. And you have moments like that, and you think, wow, it is possible. And that's good. We need those moments. But then you have moments, and you mentioned Mitch McConnell. It was the last year of the Obama administration, so just eight years later, when um, Barack Obama chose and nominated uh, Merrick Garland to be on the Supreme Court. And we all thought in the White House, there's nothing about this guy. How, he is, he's like a yeah. Boy Scout with an <laughs> incredible record, commitment to justice. He well, won 97-0 vote or something like that. And still he was blocked. And that to me is a moment where it was like, we have to kind of throw the naivete out the door here because this is not an old system of politicking. It's also not a system right now where Kamala Harris is running against John McCain or Mitt Romney. She's not. So we can't pretend it is. But I think it, it happened gradually over a period of time. Yeah. Also, if you're looking for someone who's not necessarily who we would use aggressive as the first term, it's Merrick Garland. <laughs> <laughs> and so like, yeah. Um, so, Jen, you talked about some of the themes that Brian points out uh, or kind of the, the messages that Republicans use to say that they value, they have family values and all of those things. I'm curious why, if we can see, I mean, you've outlined it in your book, but I don't think this just came to be, you know, when you started writing the book. Why, if this was in front of everyone's face, Democrats didn't, at an earlier point, use the fact that they knew this against Republicans? Like, why have they been able to get away with it for so long? I think there is, I think for two reasons. One, I think there's this enduring desire among Democrats for a time uh, in the Republican Party long ago where there's, it's still like the Tip O'Neill days and I think they're just still clinging. There's a lot of people, even today, that cling on to this notion of the Republican Party as it once was or think that by virtue of conferring onto Republicans some goodwill that it'll be reciprocated. And so we do something hoping that they'll reciprocate. They don't, and we just don't learn our lesson. And Lucy keeps pulling the football away over and over and over again. And it's so frustrating for somebody like me. And I think that's why we have a new generation, and I don't just mean age-wise, I just mean people in the political process, of people who value a desire among Democrats to fight harder and to give up on on just this, this, this romanticized idea of what the Republican Party is because it doesn't exist in practice. So there's that, that's one part of it. And I think the other part is we haven't had a media infrastructure that's allowed us to organize our messaging enough to actually push back against this stuff. And you look at, you know, I mean, not gonna go too deep into, into my qualms with, with legacy media, but if you look at what the legacy media has done, it is, it is really bending over backwards to, to do the whole both sidesism, and and you they can't really be relied on to make this 
to make this case for Democrats. And, and we don't have a media a, a messaging apparatus like the right does. The right has Fox News, OAN, Newsmax, Steve Bannon's show, Alex Jones' show. You know, th there are so many different outlets that the right has, and they exist to serve as propaganda outlets for the right. The left has no equivalent. You can't look at CNN or CBS or ABC or NBC and say that those are the equivalent to the right. They are not yeah. there to serve the Democratic Party in the same way that right-wing media is there to serve the Republican Party. And so I do argue in the book that we do need a, a stronger independent media ecosystem. We need a stronger progr progressive media ecosystem. And I do think that MSNBC has been wonderful with that. And Jen here has been wonderful with that. But I think it is important to make sure that we have messengers out there who don't exist just to, to focus solely on, on entrenching you know, the both sides journalism that we've seen for so long that has, that has failed democracy to a degree and also that Republicans know they can use to game the refs in this country. Yeah, yeah. I want to come back to a, a more robust uh, conversation about the media, but, um, you know, Jen, we've seen... Democrats, I feel like more recently, and you brought this up, Brian, kind of this new generation, not necessarily age, but people who are willing to fight. Um, do you think that's the case with Kamala Harris as she's entering her race? And do you think that this is going to be what Democrats do moving forward? You know, have we kind of stepped away from when they go low, we go high? Well, look, I, I don't think fighting back means necessarily nasty name calling. Mm -hmm. I think it's calling out hypocrisy, of which there is plenty um, <laughs> to work with there. And I think what is working for Vice President Harris, and, and Tim, Tim Walls is a little different what's working for him, although mm -hmm. they're a ticket. Vice President Harris is running fearlessly. Mm -hmm. You have to be fearless in this media environment. And what I mean by that is, you may disagree with me, it's okay, disagreement's healthy. Like, I think it's great Pete Buttigieg goes on Fox. When I was the I press secretary, agree. I did Fox News on Sunday more than any other Sunday show. You know why? Because why make them the big bad wolf? They're not, it's not, okay? you needed to give me content to cover every single Sunday. <laughs> well, <laughs> but like, it, it, it is, I, so to, just to go back to your question, I think it's not about going low or going high. It's about being fearless and being calling out hypocrisy. And what she is doing is she is, and I think she's benefiting, one, she's, she's from her fearlessness, but also there's no huge massive bureaucracy around her right yeah. now, which is I don't think what would have, it was none of this was obviously planned by anyone, but she's very decisive because she doesn't have 800 consultants and like 4,000 polls to tell her what she should say in a stump speech mm -hmm. or what she should say in a convention speech. And I actually think that doesn't work for every, yeah, <laughs> she's talking to people. You know, that doesn't work for everybody if you're not fearless, but I think it's working for her. For Tim Walls, one, I've known him a little bit since he ran for Congress in mm -hmm. 2006. And I just have to say, when he ran for Congress, he ran in a very conservative district in Minnesota, obviously, rural district. We were like, we wanted to win back the House. And we were like, that guy seems nice. Too bad he can't win. You know? <laughs> I mean, here he is. He's the vice presidential nominee. So basically, political people know nothing. Um, <laughs> but what works for him is that he speaks how everybody speaks. And I'm obsessed with this notion because I think one of... To, uh, just to add on to what Brian said, one of the challenges that I think Democrats have had, but I do think aren't having right now, is speaking in this academic ivory tower way to sound like everybody's smarter, when meanwhile people are like, what on earth are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> and Tim Wall speaks like how people talk. Mm -hmm. He's just talking about things that people care about. Like when he talks about, well, yeah, I'm Kids could, should have free lunch because if they're not hungry, they're going to learn better. I mean, like, who's against that, you know? <laughs> and so, right, um, my mother-in-law's a teacher, so I'm very, and I have little kids. Um, so I, I don't know if the framing is low high. I think it's about recognizing this is not Harris versus McCain or Harris versus Romney where we're arguing about Social Security, which is still an important issue. It is a different kind of campaign that needs to be run in a different way, mm -hmm. but it doesn't need to be nasty. What's working is actually they're quite joyful and politics should be joyful and inspirational. Yeah. I, I think also, I think something that, the, the Kamala, that Kamala and Tim Walls have 
kind of learned from the Trump campaign and the Trump White House, Trump messaging, is that you look at how he succeeded with his messaging. I mean, Democrats, for example, with, with the ACA of it all, I mean, while we were deep diving into the intricacies of Medicare Part D, uh, you look at what Donald Trump came in with his messaging, it's build the wall, lock her up, drain the swamp, make America great again. I mean, it's just beating you over the head with, like, fascist mother goose, you know, it's also, rhetoric. <laughs> that's right. And, like, it's also... It's like fascist mother goes. It's also so stale. It, yeah. It's it is, like well, this, this is an old dog. At this get point, some new yeah. tricks. Yeah. This, this is point, like the exactly. same thing. And so and so I think they looked at that and instead of instead of going into deep dives about, you know, six, 16 page policy proposals about paid family leave, it's 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 uh, you know, her, their 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 uh, their slogans now are are we're not going back. When we fight we win. Mind your own damn business. This is this is stuff that is <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. It feels so weird to take the applause for Tim Walls' <laughs> applause line, but I'll gladly take it. Right, it's working, clearly. Yeah, right. yeah, clearly, Tim yeah. If, if I'm getting applause from his line that everybody knows is his line, clearly that's a resonant <laughs> really? line. But it's, it's Democrats showing that they've learned the lessons from the Trump administration, and it doesn't have to be these deep yes. dives, and it can yeah. just be messages that are, that are, that are short, concise, compelling, uh, relevant, and, uh, and Democrats are showing that they can embrace that now, and, and it's having a big difference. Yeah. Do you think that that um, is also why maybe Project 2025 broke through? Normally, when Democrats are trying to point out all of these bad things, it just kind of falls flat, but this one seemed to really break through to to a lot of people. I think there were two things. One, Project 2025 is, is so hellish uh, that I think that really helped. But also, it, Project 2025 came about at a time where there was so little for Democrats to hold on to. I mean, this was like <laughs> in the immediate <laughs> aftermath of the debate. And, it, and we were just <laughs> looking for anything. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, anything. And so... <laughs> And so I sat down and I read that that 900 page, 900 page proposal because I was like, "What do you got? I'll take I'll take anything. <laughs> I'll take whatever you got these days." And so it gave us something to focus on because of the moment that we were in. I mean, it was such a a hopeless moment, and it was. I mean, like you know, I, I can even tell just by looking at at my channel, for example. Um, I have I have the, the the luxury of being able to see how many people are involved at any given moment what moments in the political cycle are especially, are especially busy, what moments are completely dead. In the six years that I've been on YouTube, it's never been as low as it was in the immediate aftermath of the debate. Mm -hmm. People checked out. Oh. I thought my channel broke. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even kidding. I, I had to set up a meeting with the head of news and politics <laughs> at YouTube because I was convinced that that my channel had broken or that I was the victim of some cyber attack. <laughs> <laughs> and then there were moments where I was spiraling where I'm like, I've spent so much of my life on YouTube and it's broken and <laughs> what has this all been for? <laughs> <laughs> but, but it really does go to show the way that people checked out and so Project 2025 in that moment was something to, to, to focus on and rightfully so, it deserves the attention but I think the... the the combination of those two things really brought Project 2025 into the zeitgeist in a way that I don't know that it would if it was any other political mm -hmm. moment. Yeah. Um, so something that you talk about a lot in the book is that Republicans have been kind of operating this way for some time. It's not a new phenomenon, um, thinking like about Newt Gingrich and all of the things that he was doing, but that they pushed the limits because they always knew the guardrails would be there. Um, do you think any of those people, and we can even be as recent as Kevin McCarthy, Paul Ryan, Eric Cantor, Mitch McConnell, if any of them really anticipated that the guardrails would actually fall off, if they anticipated that Donald Trump would expose them in the way that uh, he has? I don't think so. I think that Donald Trump kind of, I think that these people wanted to operate while hiding behind their branding ad nauseum. I mean, th there, was, there was no point at which I think that they, want, that they felt they were going to be exposed, but Donald Trump just lifted the veil so blatantly that it is impossible right now to call yourself the party of family values when your standard bearer, again, to your exact point, is the guy who is right now facing, facing sentencing for 34 felony counts 
for charges related to hush money payouts for an affair he had with, his, with a porn star while his wife was at home with their infant son. I mean, it's impossible to claim that, that you're the party of states' rights when your standard bearer just added $7.8 trillion to the debt. It's impossible to claim that you're the party of the Constitution when your standard bearer just prevented the peaceful transfer of power for the first time in our 200-year history. So I think what Donald Trump did was just kind of expedite the process of lifting the veil off of that party. Yeah, Jen, um, a lot of these Republicans, you know, you think about Mike Pence um, and all the people I just mentioned, they, you know, committed to Trump, and in the end, he only cares about himself, and they were sacrificed in the process. I'm curious what you think about J.D. Vance and what his fate will be since <laughs> <laughs> he's done the same well, thing. <laughs> um, what do you think about J.D. Vance? Let me just first say, my mother's a therapist, so I'm going to feel for him <laughs> That he's not living his true self, I think we can all say. Um, look, I, I will just, I will come back to that. I just want to add to, to, to um, what Brian was saying. I also think, and this is J.D. Vance as an example of this, that a number of people in the Republican Party leaders, and Mike Pence, I, I think, has had some very good moments, but they all thought they wanted to use Trump as a vehicle to get their agenda done. He's not a policy wonk. I don't know if I'm breaking any news for any of you. <laughs> and like, they were, they were like, you know what we want to do? We want to pack the court. We want to overturn Roe v. Wade. We want to do these things. And guess what? They got a lot of those things done. Why do you think a number of white evangelicals are still with him around the country? So they, they used him as a vehicle. The other thing is, I'm just going to use the analogy. I've been married for 14 years, but people who think they're going to change the boyfriend. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, they're like, listen, I am going to be the chief of yeah. staff who changes Donald Trump. You're like, you are? <laughs> Have you seen the last four people he's yeah. dated? It's like it didn't work out well. And so there's part of it that we'll use him as a vehicle, and also I'm going to change him. J.D. Vance not living his true self. Here's what I would say about him in addition to that is... Um, He's a paper tiger candidate, and there have been Democrats, Democrats and Republicans who have been like this, where people kind of look on paper and they're like, look at that guy. Mm -hmm. Kind of grew up in Appalachia. I mean, my friends who grew up there are like, <laughs> not really, you know? <laughs> but like, kind of, kind of, you know, he's, he's got a best selling book. He's happily married, seeing, he has three kids. Like, he's a senator in Ohio. It seems good, right? And then, and I remember reading his speech at the convention, and the speech as written was like perfectly good, fine. Mm -hmm. Then he delivers it, and you're like, wah, wah. <laughs> that was like not well delivered. So I think he's, he is different from what they thought he was going to be as a performer, as a, as a speaker, and also he's not truly who he's presenting himself to yeah. be. Now, I don't know what he actually believes, but if you look at his history and he was calling Trump like America's, America's Hitler, Hitler yeah. not that long ago, he was texting with friends about him. He had a very different take on a lot of things. It tells you that ambition, not a crime, but it is ambition as a driver to the point where you're reinventing yourself and changing your values. Mm -hmm. Also, people smell inauthenticity and he smells very inauthentic. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to shift gears a bit to something you brought up before, um, just our media ecosystem. And media is a big part of why Republicans have been able to do all of the things that they've been doing from their own conservative media and then sometimes traditional media as we continue to still see today. Do you think that one of those traditional media versus conservative media bears a larger responsibility? And I'm just curious what you all think about the traditional media's obsession with uh, perceived objectivity in moments where we really need the media to be doing its job. I mean, it would be crazy for me to blame like, like mainstream media more than right-wing media, <laughs> like, first of all. Like they're, they're, they definitely know what they're doing. When, when Fox's news model is basically that it's okay to pay out almost a billion dollars for lying and you're a, yeah. you're a purported news network and, you're, and part of your model is just baked into the cake that you have to pay for lying, that, that, that right there kind of gives the whole game away. So the last thing I want to do is give them any type of a break for knowingly lying. I mean, we all saw the text messages, for example, in the reporting regarding January 6th and how these people knew behind the scenes that what was happening was the fault of Donald Trump and was the result of baseless 
um, baseless lies that were put forward by him and his campaign, and then they would go on TV and just lie right to their viewers. Oh. So let's not give them a pass by, by any means. But then I think there is, uh, in, in large part, uh, it, that some culpability for the mainstream media in terms of, in terms of to your exact point, I mean, focusing so much on, 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 this, on this elusive pursuit of <laughs> acceptance by Republicans by conferring all of this, this goodwill onto them that's never reciprocated, and as if Republicans are ever going to call the New York Times and the Washington Post and CNN as if they're ever not going to refer to them as fake news. I mean, it's never going to happen. And, and yet, and yet by, by giving them all of this goodwill in hopes that it'll somehow happen, I mean, it's, it's, they do deserve a lot of the blame for that as well. Yeah, did you have any thoughts on it? Yeah, well, look, I think that a lot of the MAGA world is graded on a different scale, yeah. right? And so um, that means that, you know, when... Uh, you know, when I was in the White House, I got a Hatch Act violation letter, right? Which is, I, I think I like said one thing from the podium. Donald Trump literally held his convention on the White House <laughs> lawn. And I'm not saying they treated it as equal, but sometimes it becomes a little bit like these violations are equal and they are not, you know? Yeah. I mean, um, so that I think, I think it is difficult in media organizations who are trying to be trusted sources of news and quite credible to the American public. And I, I probably have more sympathy than you do, even though I worked as the press secretary for it, because I do think it's difficult, and the overwhelming majority of them put like some of the late night or evening hosts from Fox News outside of this, are trying to inform the public and do the best they can possibly do doing that. I'm a real believer in that. Um, but I do think that Right now, what also happens, and I don't know if we're going to get to this, but I'm just going to jump to it, is it becomes like br the three of us are not real forms of media, right? Mm -hmm. And that is something that some people in traditional media will say. And you're like, well, wait a second. First of all, I don't spend my time attacking you. I spend my time informing viewers. So, like, leave me alone. Mm -hmm. But second... It's not about you, the journalist, or the member of the media, which, by the way, is a broad spectrum, right? There's AP wire reporters, there's war correspondents, there's people who are, you know, straight down the middle people. It's about what viewers are looking for, and viewers are looking for information and context. Um, and that is a place where I think it kind of, it comes, it jumps yeah. a little bit of a shark, because you're like, the world of, of media and what people can consume to inform themselves has changed and it should yeah. change, it should continue to change to yeah. Brian's point. And it's not about the individuals, mm -hmm. it's about what viewers and the public yeah. is looking for. Yeah. And it should be about that. Yeah. Um, if you don't want to answer this because it's controversial, you don't have to, but oh. what would you say? We've really <laughs> stayed away from controversy, <laughs> Brian, and our wallflowers. What would you say to journalists who feel that journalism should be pure and should not include, you know, crooked media or the work that um, either of you are doing because you're not like professionally trained traditional journalist. I would say that it is okay to have a bias in favor of democracy. And when you have a Republican Party that is openly hostile to democracy as they are right now, it's not antithetical to the values of journalism to make sure that that's called out without having to equate it every single time with something that the Democrats do. Uh, <laughs> And that was me. That wasn't even Tim Walls' line. <laughs> May have been louder than the Tim Walls' line. <laughs> yeah, that's Don't right. tell him. Um, and so th the example that I like to use is, this is a plane that we're all on. And, and if Donald Trump is successful with Project 2025, with getting into office, with consolidating power in the executive branch, and we do our, our, our sprint toward totalitarianism, toward an authoritarian form of government, Autocrats have no need for a free and fair press. And so the press is on the plane with us. If this plane goes down, they're going down with it. The first thing that happens it, with, with an authoritarian is they get rid of a free and fair press. Mm -hmm. So it is okay to show bias in favor of democracy, again, without feeling the need to, to drag Democrats in every single time and, and do the both sides thing. That bias is okay. Yeah, I mean, sometimes the sky's blue and everybody can say it's <laughs> yeah. blue. Right. And it doesn't make you biased because you say it's blue. Um, 
you know, I think just to add to Brian, I, I think it's also that, um, I kind of already said this, but I think people are looking for all sorts of different information. I mean, obviously, how many YouTube followers? You have three million, I'm just gonna brag about you. Million. Three million. Okay, <laughs> like, yeah, it's pretty amazing. And people go to, Brian, people go and watch his videos because they're like, I wanna learn about a substantive issue and better understand it, right? People listen to the range of shows on Crooked Media. I'm, I listen to them. We were just talking about how we're not as up to date on all of them because now there's so <laughs> many episodes. Um, because I want to hear what they think about things. It doesn't mean it's the same as what I think. Give people credit, right? Yeah. I mean, I hope people watch my show because I'm going to tell them, this is what I think is going on here. It doesn't mean they have to agree with me. And the suggestion that there's no space for any of that mm -hmm. is it, just, just like out of touch with how people consume information, I yeah. think. That is the thing, in yeah. my view. Yeah. Well, thank you for answering. Um, so something you bring up in the book uh, is that it's hard to get people's attention. It's hard to break through, and that is what a lot of content, be it traditional media or any other kind of media, is trying to do. So how, why do you think your content has broken through? And Jen, would love to hear, you know, when you were press secretary, your press briefings broke through, and why do you think that was able to happen? It's a good question. I, I, think, I think I benefited from a couple of things. First of all, I came into YouTube at a time when people were just starting to get their news uh, through that type of medium. And so I started posting on Facebook and YouTube to basically nobody in 2018, 2019. I mean, tens of people. And, <laughs> and it was the right time to do it. And, and I think I just did it consistently. But uh, you know, I, look, I, tr I try to do it in a way that's, that's, that's authentic, that I think will, will, will reach people. I try to do it in a way that's, that's concise, which is kind of antithetical to the entire 24-hour media model that we have today. And I don't know how you can sit down and drop in to, to news today and, and feel like you're getting the full picture if you've missed seven hours of content before and you're going to miss, you know, 13, 15 hours of content after, and so I, I, try to, I try to create content in the same way that I want to consume it, which is, which is to get right to the point, to get everything you need to know, and then to be out. Um, and so I think, that, I think that's helpful. Uh, you know, I, a lot of it was luck, a lot of it is just trying to, to give my take on things that I think is, is a common sense take, and I think that's something that we've, we've been missing for a long time in the Democratic Party. I mean, this harkens back to the initial point, which is, which is Republican media, or right-wing media, it's a Freudian slip, because exists to, to serve the Republican Party, but we've never had media that actually advocates for the, the virtues of of progressivism, mm -hmm. and, and that's something that I, I believe deeply in, and it's something that, that the majority of Americans believe in, whether it's on healthcare, whether it's on climate change, whether it's on common sense gun safety reforms, whether it's on reproductive rights, whether it's on workers' rights, or unions, or paid leave. I mean, the list goes on and on, and without a media infrastructure there to properly convey that message, I mean, I, I think there was just just a hunger for that kind of thing. Yeah. And, uh, and since then, we've, we've seen the progressive independent space explode, and I think that's a testament to that as well. Yeah, okay. This is, I love, this is such a funny, because when I started as the White House press secretary, it was COVID, right? I never, oh, yeah. I didn't have any <laughs> social life. I had two little kids. We wore two masks, we got tested twice a day. I don't think I left the White House building during the day for like three months, right? So I had no, I mean, I didn't, you know, you see like things on social media, but you, basically when I did that job, my primary focus was like, am I doing what Joe Biden wants me to do? That's what the job is, right? And when I first met with him, he was like, okay, first of all, I don't want cabinet members tweeting at people in the middle of the night. I was like, is that, like, is Tony <laughs> Blinken gonna be up late at night? I, I don't think so. I was like, I don't think that's a thing. I don't think, I'm not concerned knowing who he's nominating, but, um, but he also wanted to return some form of civility to the briefing room, right? Um, he also wanted um, it not to be a form for disinformation. And I'd been in the State Department, I was a State Department so extortion for a couple of years, which was like the perfect training ground because in that room, you have Russian state media, you have state media from all many parts of the world. And so 
you know, my friend, we actually had a good relationship, Peter Ducey, was not a Russian, it wasn't like, it was yeah. fine, I was like, okay, it's okay, <laughs> you know, we can, I know he's going to come at this and he's going to ask questions that are from a certain slant, mm -hmm. but we had a good professional relationship, it was okay. So, come back to your question, I like, when I finally went out and did like a, I, I went and threw the first baseball out at the, at the Nationals game, this was back in like May of 2021, my husband was like, I was like, I don't know if I've ever thrown a baseball before. <laughs> My husband was like, you'll be fine. I was like, did you see the Dr. Fauci video? I'm not sure I'm going to be fine. <laughs> but that aside, I practiced. But that was like the first thing. I, and then pe people were saying like, hi, Jen. Hi. And I was like, are they talking, are they talking to me? <laughs> I was like so confused. So my point is I had no I, I didn't know that oh, people were like funny. consuming things. <laughs> I was just like doing my job and, and, you know, trying to focus on knowing everything I knew about, to know about COVID, about everything happening in the world. Yeah, Lots and when I first <laughs> started going, when I, at that baseball game, I was like super awkward. People were like, hey, Jen, and I was like, I'm Jen, and they were like, no, I know, and I was like, oh. So my husband was like, oh, my, we need to, you need to like socially readapt. <laughs> that is, so, they're just doing your job, and you're doing it well. That's what, that's what you're just, yeah, that's what you have to do in that job. You gotta just do your job, be it, you know, and it's funny because in that job, mm. especially at that moment, you had to kind of um, be as calm you had to take yeah. a little bit of your personality down because that's what was needed in the room, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, I also find that sometimes when I meet people and engage with them, they're like, oh, you're like laughing. You're not like all serious yeah. all the time. I'm like, of course I'm not, you know? <laughs> but that was, you know, that was what that job was at the time. Yeah. Well, you so. think you're ill-adjusted uh, after, after working in the White House. Uh, for me to be standing here when I'm in gym shorts and a suit top in my <laughs> house... <laughs> We need Staring at a computer screen uh, for 16 hours a day. This is a this is a pretty big adjustment. Now you need now we need like the full yeah, we need the full suit. scope of the Brian Tyler Cohen setup. Oh, I mean the setup is like full business on top. It looks like this, and then I'm wearing uh, Nike gym shorts and uh, walking over. I've got now my, we all know. I've got my dog right right you know by my feet, and uh, and and that's it. I mean it's it really is uh, the the not so glamorous underbelly of the YouTube world. Yeah. The first place, and this is actually a nice setup because I built a studio in, in my house, but my first setup when I was first getting started uh, was the foot of my bed in some arbitrary white section, nondescript white section of my wall, and that, that was it. And, and just, you know, roll out of bed and there was a tripod right at the foot of it, and that was, the, that was my media empire. <laughs> I mean, now here you are. Now here I am. <laughs> Um, I'm going to ask one more question, and then um, we can open up uh, the conversation to you all. So if you have questions, you can line up at, at the microphones, and we'll also take some questions for the folks joining us online. Uh, my last question is a two-parter. The first is, Ryan, in, your, in the book, you mentioned that traditional media won't save us, and that we need this larger progressive media infrastructure but that it should not just be kind of the progressive opposite of what's happening on the right. right. So what should that look like? And then everyone in here doesn't, you know, isn't on MSNBC, doesn't have a big YouTube channel. So how can they plug in to be effective and kind of leverage what they have to have an impact? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna do the second part okay. first because I think this is, uh, this is especially important right now. Uh, the example that I like to use is the, exam the example of Wisconsin. And that is that the difference between a Biden win in 2020 and a Trump win in 2020 was two votes per precinct. And so if there was ever any doubt about the extent to which uh, we can have a big impact on an individual basis, it's that if Trump was able to flip two people per precinct in the state of Wisconsin, which is often viewed as the tipping point state in our elections, then he would have won that state. And so my, my request to people is, Find somebody in your circles of people who wouldn't otherwise have voted, and we all have somebody like that in our lives. My own sister was living in Florida in 2018, and I asked if she was going to vote in the gubernatorial election, and she's, she just got her PhD, and she asked me what a governor was. <laughs> so wow. if I have someone like that in my family, and I'm sure she would love, <laughs> love the fact that she loves this story. 500 people <laughs> know this story, um, it, you know, if, if she, if I have someone like that in my family, uh, especially somebody who's getting her PhD, then like I know that there are people everywhere who aren't paying attention to politics, who feel disaffected because of politics, who just aged into politics, 
and who have been susceptible to misinformation by politics, and so make those people your responsibility. I always view what I do uh, in talking to people and talking to you all right now, not as, as the end of the line, but the beginning. It's, it's, I'm trying to arm people with messaging that you can then bring out, kind of like as tribunes in, in a way, to then reach out to your circles of people who aren't getting filtered into the YouTube algorithm, who aren't paying attention to politics. And so, so arm yourself with that good information, find people in your lives who wouldn't otherwise know it, and make those people your responsibility. Because if you're seeking out political content, you're probably already participating in the political process. The hard part is, is finding people beyond that. And, and I think that we all have a, a role to play. And so I, I know that, you know, look, I, I can reach, I can reach a million people with a video, but it is, it is actually impacting one or two people who wouldn't otherwise have voted, and that's where the actual difference lies. Yeah. And he's gonna give all of you his cell phone number for like individual help, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, Jen, what are your thoughts on how people can engage? And if you disagree with everything Brian said, um, no, what are, your are you thoughts kidding? I, I, joking aside, what if I, Jen was like, that's not it. I call Brian <laughs> and I'm like, how do we do that? You know, I think what, what's so important to, about what Brian said is that sometimes it feels overwhelming mm -hmm. on how you can impact, how you can have impact. And it doesn't need to be. And I always think about, I mean, I worked for Barack Obama for 10 years, right? I traveled with him on both campaigns. So I know his stump speech, basically. Don't worry, I'm not going to do it right now. But like, <laughs> Jen is tell, like, look. Look, look, um, he, tell, he told this story for a long time about this little lady in South Carolina with a hat and how, you know, people may know the story. My point is that story is about how one person can change a room, how one room can change a county, how one county can change a state. And it is about how one person, you can empower yourself to have impact. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be I alone am going to make sure Kamala Harris is elected. Right. Like no one can do that, right? It is like I'm gonna talk to 10 people in my neighborhood over the next two weeks. That's hugely impactful. And I think making up bite size makes it more digestible. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Oh, did you have something to add? No, oh, no, okay. let's do it. Let's um, do some questions. Okay, I'm just gonna read a couple from the folks online and then um, we can get started with uh, uh, you all at the microphone. So we have one question from uh, Bill in Denver. Were you surprised that more Republicans didn't take a stand against Trump running again? I, I was because they're they're usually so uh, courageous, and so <laughs> and so that just shook me to my core. Uh, no, not at all. I mean, this is it, it, you know these people they uh, they beat their chest as alphas, but then cower at the feet of this of this guy who has lost them elections in 2018, 2020, 2022, 2023, and is out there right now advocating for an imaginary cannibal and claiming that Nikki Haley was in charge of the Capitol on January 6th. So no, uh, it does not surprise me. I can't get, wrap my head around it, but no, it doesn't surprise me. Makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, this person did not leave their name or location, uh, but they want to know what is the most evil aspect of Project 2025, in your opinion? Oh, boy. <laughs> Do you want to take this one? Hello, to... Anonymous out there. <laughs> um, <clears throat> God, there's I, a lot. I have one. Oh, go ahead. Okay, so Schedule F. Uh, that would be the reclassification of, of hundreds of thousands of career civil servants who currently work in the government into political appointees. Right now, when a president comes into office, they can, they can fire and hire about 4,000 people with Schedule F, and it would reclassify these, these hundreds of, basically the entire federal government, make them political appointees. That means that you can replace those people with people who are loyal not to the Constitution or the rule of law, but rather to you. And so think about, for example, what would happen if you staff the entire DOJ with, again, not pr career prosecutors, and I believe that we have Glenn Kirshner in this room. Oh, we love Glenn <laughs> Kirshner. Where is he at? There he is. <laughs> oh, oh, up there. <laughs> I mean, Glenn, this is bigger than Tim Walls. <laughs> I mean, yeah, up in the uh, please. That's right. Glenn Kirshner is bigger than Tim Walls. We're just like yeah. going by crowd yeah. hearing. Um, 
Think about what would happen, for example, if the DOJ was staffed not by career prosecutors, but rather people like Jeffrey Clark or just people who are just loyal to Donald Trump. Think about what the FBI would look like if it was staffed with people who are loyal to Donald Trump. Think about, for example, in the 2020 election when they were trying to validate these bogus claims of a stolen election, but you had people in the DOJ who wouldn't, who wouldn't humor these claims. And even Bill Barr had to say this was bullshit because it, the, the people behind him wouldn't have, pro there was no way to prosecute this stuff if you have serious people. Now imagine it's staffed by these sycophants for Donald Trump and you bring forward claims of fraud and all of a sudden they validate it. Think about what happens, for example, if they try to uh, seize the voting machines or, 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 uh, or prevent ballots from being counted in Milwaukee or Detroit or Philadelphia. How do you win Wisconsin or Michigan or Pennsylvania without those major population centers? So they could do a lot of damage by virtue of just simply reclassifying uh, career civil servants as political appointees. And so that is something that flies under the radar because it's kind of wonky, but absolutely something that everybody here should know about. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to add to that. We want to get some more questions. Sweet. Um, yeah. So we can start with questions. So we'll alternate back and forth, but we can start with you here in the striped shirt. Test? Okay. Uh, hi, uh, my name's Connor. I'm originally from Maryland, but I go to Michigan uh, State as a college student, and so a lot of the time I spend there is trying to do things like you said, reaching out to um, maybe disinterested voters, people who don't know what's going on really. And so I guess kind of in, t in line with those type of questions, do you think that it might it, that it's worth the effort to try and reach out to people who are, you know, whether it's the ultra left that Kamala Harris and Donald Trump are equally bad or the neoliberal centrists that are like they're both equally bad and not people who are I guess unengaged but who are actively against voting for both parties do you think it's worth the effort to try and reach out to them and try and get them to see that you know maybe one party is a bit better um, than the other party or, or is that just kind of a lost cause I think first of all thank you for what you're doing if you could bring home Michigan that would be great <laughs> Connor no pressure um, Connor Connor, thank you for what you're doing. I was not involved in politics really in college, so you're way ahead of me. I don't know about you guys. Um, yes, it's worth it. Even if you look at the polls just over the last couple of weeks, there's this group of voters called double haters, which is just a funny name, but like people who hated, you know, didn't like either candidate, right? Whatever the reasons were. Um, a lot of those people have come um, over to Harris um, some of them have come home to the Democratic Party, as in they were voters for Biden in 2020. Maybe they were always going to come home. It's impossible to know. But if somebody has like 500 MAGA signs and like an upside down flag, like don't door knock there. But like, <laughs> you know, but otherwise, I do think that it is worth engagement because some people may feel disillusioned. Maybe they don't know what's at stake on any range of issues. Maybe it's Schedule F. Maybe it's abortion rights. Maybe it's something else. But I think this is exactly the right time before early voting starts for you to do exactly what you're doing. You're not going to win over every person. But Wisconsin, to, to Brian's point, less than 1% in the last few elections. So Michigan could be that. And whatever you're doing could have that impact of people who may feel disillusioned, not quite informed yet. Remember, most people, not in this room, I bet, don't pay attention until after Labor Day, right? So you got a lot of, you, 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 this is exactly the time to be doing it. That's my take. That's perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Connor. Test. As you know, Project 2025 outlines the defunding, realignment, and or elimination of federal agencies that work on climate change, such as the EPA and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. It would also place a variety of constraints on federal employees at large, including transgender federal employees who either have already transitioned or wish to transition in the future. Do you have any advice for current or aspiring federal employees who work on issues related to climate change but are facing uncertainty in their professional and personal lives? And relatedly, what is your advice for transgender federal employees who are pre-transition but hesitant to transition due to what Project 2025 may have in store for them? Jen. First of all, I hate this. It's like breaking my heart and uh, it's horrible. Like all the stuff that's in there. I don't even know if I'm supposed to mention this, but I'm going to anyway. We're, MSNBC is gonna, we're doing a podcast where we break down specific different pieces of this, including one on climate, one on um, transgender, LGBTQ, because 
the Schedule F piece is something that's kind of floating around, even if people don't understand it. But there are so many pieces, like the ones you mentioned, that aren't even out there in the ether. So what I would say, there's limitations on what federal employees can do in their political lives, and I don't know what it is for each of these people. But what I would say is they are powerful communicators about how this would impact them, the work they're doing, um, the things they care about and passionate about, and they're passionate about, and also their lives, if, especially if they are transgender employees, and telling their stories and whatever their platforms are to inform their friends, their neighbors, their communities, I think is one of the most powerful things that they can do as individuals. Um, I don't. I think it's very hard to, when you're working, I mean, I worked at the State Department for years, and I know when Trump came in, for them, in a different way, it was incredibly heartbreaking because of a lot of the work they'd been working on for so long. And so this is sort of a cycle we've seen in some ways, but this is a whole other level of extreme. But I don't know if you guys have better well, that's, advice, that's additional perfect. advice, thoughts? No, I think that's, I think perfect. that nailed yeah. it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for raising these things. It seems yeah. like you are like doing an effective job of informing people about them too. Hi, Brian and Jen. Uh, my name is Alex, and one of my first memories, was, or one of my favorite memories was campaigning for Barack Obama in North Carolina when I was in oh, high school. I'm from North Carolina. That's oh, great. Fun. We love so it. I went out on election night getting up the, um, the, the scraps, getting them to the polls on election night, and then later that night we got to win North Carolina and the election. <sighs> So it was great. Who says it wasn't you? I'm not saying that. <laughs> it, it was no? a close one. It yeah. was a close one. In North it was, Carolina. yeah. yeah. Um, my question is, how do we take back the messaging on the economy? I, I think there's just this zombie idea that Trump is good for the economy, when I think everyone here just knows it's not true, but trying to put together an argument just seems too intellectual. How do we win back the economy? <laughs> Are you saying people aren't going to vote on GDP numbers? Is that what you're <laughs> do you want to start this? You, you can. You can take it. Well, I mean, something. I, something I do like to, to go, point you out have is that. You say. Is that in if you, and this is one of these persisting persisting lies that they've kept up is that they're somehow the the party that's good on the economy. Since I've been alive, there has never been a Republican administration that's created more jobs than a Democratic Democratic administration. Since I've been alive, there's never been a Republican administration that's had a lower unemployment rate than a Democratic administration. Since I've been alive, we've never had a stronger economy in a Republican administration than a Democratic administration. So how this persists is beyond me, but I think if you just point out the fact that show us a single number or a single metric on which Republicans have been stronger on the economy than Democrats, and not the reality, which is that re the last three Republicans Republican presidents have left office in recessions, and the last three Democratic presidents have taken office and cleaned up their mess. That's very good. So you had some things to get off your chest. I will just that, add one. Glenn, Glenn, I think that was I think that was actually louder than yours. Yeah. But, but barely. <laughs> Um, I would add just one thing. This, this is just to go back to what we were talking about before. Is th the data is on the side of the number, to, to Brian's point, right? The data, also like new inflation numbers, like going down, the job creation, there's lots of good data. People don't vote on data. People vote on how they are feeling in their lives, and this is something to remember, right? So who is Kamala Harris fighting for? Is she fighting for people who want to get a college education, people, workers who are trying to have their rights defended, women who want to make choices about their own body? She is. Who is Donald Trump fighting for? He's fighting for himself. I mean, it's about making it about what people are living and experiencing because even, I mean, I, I was like the economic spokesperson for the Obama administration for a while. I don't even entirely know what all the data means. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> how is it impacting every person's life? And you just have to, this is why it's so important. People are, people are the best, communi trusted communicators are the ones you know, who know you, right? And so, but, but it's about the Democratic Party talking about this in more of an, which actually Joe Biden does very well and Kamala Harris does very well, talking about it in a way that's about human beings and their experience and not like, look at my chart I yeah. have here to the right. Because it's like, that doesn't, that's not how people vote. Thank you. Uh. Thank you. My name's Jordan. Thank you so much for taking the time to answer these questions. Um, turning to a different form of progressive media that 
I don't think it's come up tonight, but we all know about those texts we get in our inboxes with those, <laughs> with those fake 400% matches. What you, do you, blame, you blame Jen for this? <laughs> me? Yeah, you worked Ho in the government. Hey, you worked on campaign, though? Hopefully no, hopefully no one's impersonating you, but with all those fake 400% match things that everyone's getting, what do you think the Democratic Party could be doing to combat some of the more egregious scams that are taking advantage of our donors as grassroots enthusiasm grows and in the meantime what can donors and activists do to make sure that they're giving their money to say the down ballot candidates who need it most instead of another scam pack that's just making someone rich what a good question yeah. like in a very informed yeah. question i've never been asked and i've not thought about a great deal but um do you, do I you have want to take this one? go <laughs> yeah. thoughts yeah well votesaveamerica.com um vote save america is the program that we run at crooked but part of we have a few different fundraising um funds but the thing we do is take all the guesswork out of you know is this person reputable are they trusting when you donate through Vote Save America, you have to opt in to be communicated with. We don't sell people's information just to avoid a lot of that. Um, if you want to kind of figure this stuff out for yourself, when you get an email or a text, click, you can click the link, and if it's Act Blue, you can actually see who it's going to, or at the bottom of the email, see who it's going to, and then go to the website. If it's not a lot there, or you can go to Open Secrets and just when was this created? Um, a lot of, in 2020, we had a fund called Get Mitch. And that was our Senate fund to raise money to get Mitch McConnell out of, um, you know, the majority uh, position. After it went viral, after RBG died, I saw so many fake versions of it pop up and people were just making money off of it. So it is really important to like, read the fine print, or you don't have to do that. You can just go to Vote Save America. And what a good question, <laughs> though. I, that's a, yeah, thank yeah. you. Very smart. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I'm a community solar developer, and my industry has experienced pretty, um, pretty extreme growth from the Inflation Reduction Act. Mm -hmm. And so there's quite a bit of concern around the risks that are posed to the IRA under a possible second Trump administration. So my question is, how well-founded do you think those uh, concerns are with it already being signed into law? I, I, I do think that they're well-founded, and I do think that most of the climate agenda would be at risk. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, look, the, the easy answer is to do what we can to make sure that that doesn't get, that, that, that he doesn't get in office, because I do think that he'll be completely hostile to clean energy, which is, so bizarre, especially bizarre to me, because what that would do is effectively seed all clean energy manufacturing to China. Mm -hmm. And so we have a Republican Party that fear mongers about China to, to beat its chest, basically, while simultaneously advocating for policies where it would, it would allow China to entrench its, its superiority in the biggest and fastest growing sector in the entire world, which is clean energy, especially in light of how explosive its growth has been right here in the U.S. So, so I mean, we've added 800,000 manufacturing jobs. The vast majority are in clean energy. So um, I, would, I would hope that that industry itself would be able to, to push the market without too much interference by, by the government. But the fact is that, that I, I do think that the Trump administration, a second Trump administration, would, would be... Would be very kind to fossil fuel and, and, and dirty energy. And so, uh, you know, our, our job at this point is, you know, I, I think we cross that bridge, hopefully we never get to it, but I, I do think that our, our job is right now, right now to make sure that they don't get into office because I, I, I don't think there's a way that they could be, uh, you know, like, I don't think there's a way they could distance themselves from, from oil and gas that basically funds their campaigns. Thank you. Hi, thanks for coming tonight. Um, I do f feel a need to defend that there have been previous attempts to form progressive ecosystems. I'm thinking specifically yeah. about Al Gore's attempts, but <laughs> anyway. Um, so do any of you think there's a chance that this unique election cycle will possibly move us in the direction of a possible UK style, shorter, oh. not four year. <laughs> oh God, um, I think every 
a lot of people would rejoice at that, including perhaps you. Um, <laughs> the challenge was this. There's such a big political <laughs> ecosystem in this country, right? There's way too much money. There's way too many outside groups. There's all sorts of problems we could talk about for a long time. And an election is about defeating the other person. And so it's all triggered by when people, I mean, I'm, you know, my first presidential campaign was John Kerry, right? And I started working for him in March or April of 2003. Now people are announcing their run for president like right after the midterm elections. And so what's challenging is it's all triggered by the other people, right? And there's incentivizing for, because people want to win. And so they think they can't wait. Um, that would be amazing, though. Um, I think it would be wonderful if it was like 100 days and everybody focused on it and everybody's informed and it would be cool. But we'll see. I don't know. It would be cool if Democrats just always did bait and switches now. <laughs> <laughs> next election cycle, who's, next elec election cycle, we put up Patrick Leahy. <laughs> Until like until like September <laughs> and stick Pete Buttigieg in there. <laughs> yeah, it, it figures Pete would get the biggest applause line of the night. Right, yes. <laughs> all right, these are all wonderful questions. We have time for two more this evening. Okay. <laughs> Make it snappy. <laughs> Well, thank you, thank you all for being here. I mean, I really appreciate it. Thank you for your time being here. I'm a 23-year military veteran, retired. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your service. Thank you. And I say that to say that I'm passionate about how I love this country. And what really alarms me is that there's people on the other side that really seem to me don't care about democracy unless they're in charge. Mm -hmm. So to me, like, like, Jen, I know you may know some of these people. Do they really feel that way? I mean, to me, Trump is one person. I'm like, how can one person corrupt so many people that, to me, are educated, Harvard graduated, Yale, all these guys? Why are they so willing to throw the Constitution away, destroy everything? Just for, Is it just power? They just want to be in power? If they're not in power, burn it down? Is I that mean, really what all of them are feeling like? I mean, Trump is one person. He cannot do this without help from all these other people. You're right. How do they all do this? It's a really, um, it's a really, really important point. Let me first assure everyone I'm not secretly hanging out with Stephen Miller <laughs> on the side. I don't, but I, I will say this. A lot of the people, not, not enough, but when Brian was saying earlier, like, is he, was he surprised that people haven't spoken out? No. But a lot of people in the hallways of Congress, and reporters will tell you this, will say, like, oh, my God, I can't believe this is happening, and how is he the nominee, and, like, all of this. Now, that's not exactly courage when you're saying that privately. But your point about the enablers around him is such an important one for people to know and understand. I mean, Trump can't, he couldn't have just, like, tried to overturn the election in 2020 on his own. He needed all of these people willing to be fake electors. He needed people in Congress, including, by the way, Mike Johnson, a little-known bit character at the time, who's now the Speaker of the House, who was willing to move that forward. And all of these enablers, there's enough of them around him, and even more of them around him somehow than there were in 2020. I mean, I think one of the reasons he picked J.D. Vance is because J.D. Vance basically said, he would be happy to move forward with a plan like that, right? That's not something Mike Pence was saying. That's not something a lot of other people were saying. So why did they think this way? I don't know. They're ruining their own party, right? A party that I may not have agreed with on policy ideas, but had just different policy ideas, if you look back to pre-Trump era. Um, and what's sad is that there are so many that seem to be quiet even though they know better. And I will say a, lot of the, a number of the people who are being loud are women, and some of them are younger women, right? 
like, where are all of these, like, older men who served by him and are scared and now, like, won't go on television? Yeah. You know what I mean? You have people like Sarah Matthews, Cassidy Hutchinson. I mean, Lynn Cheney, she's, I'm not saying she's not 25, but she's, like, very, <laughs> she's great. Um, you know, they are all outspoken, and there's a lot of people who aren't. And, and that's also a sad thing. I had a lot to say in answer to your question, but I, hopefully I answered it. <laughs> um, Hello. Thank you for holding this event. Um, I was originally going to ask about the head scratcher between Trump and Elon Musk, but I'm going to end <laughs> on a soft question that's been brewing, simmering with me for oh. so long. Oh boy! And no one's been able to answer this, and I'm just waiting you for it to happen. You think we will? <laughs> yes. No pressure. <laughs> no I think you have We're the inside. You have the here. inside track to answer this because no one else was able to, and I. I'm just dying for this well, to happen all the time with, e <laughs> with, with Kamala. I want, I want this to happen with Kamala Harris because I want to see what she would do. Why in the heck didn't Hillary Clinton turn around when Trump was hovering behind her during the debate? Why, and wouldn't it have changed something if she turned around and told him, get back in your corner? Wouldn't oh. it have changed something? I, uh, that, see, why, of course no one can answer that question. <laughs> no one knows the answer to that. I'm guessing there's like an SNL skit that should be done about the alternative storyline here and path, right? What would have happened? Um, impossible to know. What I do think, and I would hope Hillary Clinton, who is like spicy as all get out in the best way right now, um, and has been for a while, would say is that we all learned a lot about Trump not just from 2016, but certainly then from 2020, we now know in a very different way as a collective system how to run against him, including what to do in a debate like that. I don't think anyone would agree to a debate exactly in that format again, but um, you know, she did a great service in many, many ways, um, including running against him in 2016, but I don't think we'll ever know the answer to that. I, I'll, I'll add, I'll add one think? thing, <laughs> I'll add one thing, and that is, I think that, in a way, uh, Hillary Clinton being on that stage that night gave a blueprint for, has it been eight years now? Eight years later, yeah. for if Donald Trump tries that shit against Kamala Harris. <laughs> what she does. <laughs> yeah. She, she will know what to do, and Trump will regret it, and so, no pun intended here, but in this sense, I guess you could say that Hillary Clinton walked so that Kamala Harris could run. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. <laughs> uh, thank you. That was good. Thank you all for your questions. Thank you for being here today. Thank Let's you. give another round of applause to Brian and Jen. <laughs> Good job. You're great. Go buy more copies of his book. <laughs> oh, wait. I, I should take a selfie. Yeah, I should, yeah. Hold on. Will you Thank guys get you. in? Yeah. Okay. He's going to do a selfie. We're going to do a selfie, OK? He's got a lot of followers. Come here. Oh. We can... Oh, how do we get in here? Yeah, let's, uh... You tell us where to stand. Yeah, I can crouch down. <laughs> how do you, let's see. Guys, he's uh, really good at technology, I promise. Selfie, well, here we go. After the selfie, if you could please just stay standing while our guests make their way backstage, we sincerely appreciate it. Okay, here we go. Oh, no. Oh, One, look two, it. three. Okay. <laughs> All right, great. All right. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much to Brian Tyler Cohen, Jen Saki, and Shaniqua McClendon. And thank you all for joining us. Again, if you can please...